You know, this, uh, as I'm studying the text all throughout this week that we're going to be talking about together today, I'm reminded of this, that our worship and our witness always have an effect. We don't always see it, but our worship of the Lord and our witness to others about the Lord is always being watched by those around us. It's being watched by our, our, our children, our grandchildren. It's being watched by our family members, our neighbors, our co-workers. It's always on display. If we have a relationship with the Lord, if we truly worship him, not just by singing songs in this place together, but with our very lives, and if we're openly talking to other people about Jesus, whether it's proclaiming the gospel or sharing what God has done for us in our own lives, our own answered prayers, our own times in the valley when the Lord has been present with us, and all the other ways in which he blesses us, our witness and our worship is always on display before the world, pointing to God. And you know, it's often through this that other people come to see God in you. They come to hear the gospel and see it lived out in your life. But interestingly, it seems that when we're going through difficult times, true hardships, tragedies, times of suffering, that when our our worship and our witness tends to be amplified all the more. In fact, I can remember back to so many different people in my life who went through really difficult times. A terminal cancer diagnosis and walking through that path and several other things like that where it's more than just having a bad day, but something has severely shifted in life and hardship beyond imagination is being lived through and yet we see faith unwavering, people unshaken, in their confidence in the Lord, and that speaks all the more than merely in the good times of life through our worship and our witness. As we go through the book of Acts, we see a lot of times of hardship. We see a lot of times of suffering from those who went before us to proclaim the gospel around the world. And Paul is uh, probably the prime example. And we're going to see a passage today in which Paul again experiences intense hardship for the gospel And what God is able to do through that season of hardship that Paul endured. And so if you have your Bibles with you, turn with me to the book of Acts chapter 16. And we're going to start in verse 16. So that's easy to remember. Acts 16, 16. If you don't have your Bibles with you, it will also be up on the screen. But here's what it says in Acts 16, starting in verse 16. Once when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. She followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, these men are servants of the most high God who are telling you the way to be saved. I don't exactly know how she said it, but we went with that emphasis today. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and said to the spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. And at that moment, the spirit left her. Now, I want to I want to just give you a little bit of, of, of context here. If you were with us in the last couple of weeks, uh, a refresher, if you will. Uh, But Paul is on a second missionary journey, and he is traveling to this area of Macedonia. God had had changed his plans, had course corrected, had taken him to where the gospel needed to go next. And among the cities of Macedonia, Luke, uh, inspired by the Holy Spirit, settles into this account in the book of Acts and tells us what took place in the city of Philippi. And so if you were with us last week, we saw that that there is a very, very small Jewish contingent in the city 
of Philippi. In fact, there was no synagogue. And so Paul, seeking out the Jews to bring the gospel to them first, had to go outside of the city down to the river to find the place of prayer for the Jewish people on the Sabbath day. And there he proclaimed the gospel and several people came to faith in Jesus, one of whom is this woman by the name of Lydia, who we're going to see again in just a short time. And so in our account here, in these first few verses, we see something that yeah, you, know, you can imagine how that could be annoying to um, to Paul, having this 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 spirit possessed girl coming around and shouting things. But let me just make sure we understand what's happening here. Slavery is a is a part of Roman society, a a very important not important part, but a a it's a culture that's steeped in this. It is a firm part of this socio economic world of the Roman Empire. Remember that in Rome, there was virtually no middle class. There was the wealthy, the rich, the powerful, and they're the ones who typically own the slaves. And then below that, there was the poor, and below that was freed people, those who used to be slaves and were granted their freedom, and then there were slaves. And so this slave girl would have belonged to a rich and powerful and affluent person in Roman society within the city of Philippi. And in this case, they used her for her ability to be able to predict the future, which she only had the ability to do through this evil spirit that possessed her. And this demon was causing the girl to become an obstacle to Paul's proclamation of the gospel. You know, when you read those words that she's saying, it doesn't seem like she's saying anything bad, right? These men are servants of the Most High God. They're, they're here to tell you how to be saved. That sounds like a good thing. But for whatever reason, the fact that Paul found it so annoying, it is set clearly an evil spirit that is trying to distract from the gospel ministry that Paul and his companions have been called to do. Um, and so it had to be dealt with. How did Paul respond? He cast out the demon. Uh, he was a lot more patient than Jesus. Every time a demon-possessed person came before Jesus, he cast them out. Paul at least waited a few days. But uh, he cast out the demon, and that had repercussions for the slave girl and for, their, for her owners. Because remember, slaves were only owned by the rich and the powerful. And they were not happy when Paul did what Paul did. And so we continue reading in verse 19. It says, when our owners realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, these men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were, were listening to them. You know, from a, a strictly human perspective, Paul and Silas had a few things that were working against them in this particular instance. First, they had just upset a wealthy and probably a very influential person in the town of Philippi who was able to win over the crowds and win over the magistrates, probably with very little effort. Second, something that probably contributed to this was that Paul and Silas were Jews. And in the city of Philippi, that put them in an uncomfortable position. Remember, there is no synagogue because there is such a small Jewish population. The Jews in Philippi and, they, and, and, and Paul and Silas being counted among them, they would have been the minority. They would have been outsiders, foreigners, people with different customs, people who didn't worship the same gods, people who didn't participate in the festivals and things that were for the deities of the city. Uh, those who ate weird food and avoided the things that everybody else did. They were the strangers, the, down, the, the ones that looked, looked down upon. And so Paul and Silas being Jewish people, that was not something in their favor as they stood before the magistrates uh, on this particular day. Let me ask you this question. What would you do if you were in Paul and Silas's position? What would you do? You didn't do anything wrong, 
right? You were seized and your accusers were now lying to the magistrates about your supposed crimes. What did Paul do? He cast out a demon. What is he being said to do? Oh, he's a Jewish person and he's trying to corrupt us with their ways that are not lawful for us. So they're being falsely accused. The whole town is now set against you. The magistrates believe the false accusations. They have you publicly flogged. They have you put in a prison cell. They have, there's no light in the prison cell and they have your, your feet put in stocks so you can't even move. What would you do if this were you? My guess is that most, if not all of us, would probably shout, uh, protest, complain, maybe beg, maybe cry, uh, attempt to explain, call out the liars who are falsely accusing us. Uh, something. Wouldn't you think to do something in that moment when your whole world is falling apart and it's a complete injustice and you did not deserve any of it? What would you do? Some of us might try to escape might try to fight for our lives, fight for our freedom, uh, you know, escape or die trying. But what did Paul and Silas do? We see in verse 25, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. After this entire ordeal, they're sitting there in the middle of a prison cell, and don't think our comfortable prison cells by these, you know, in contrast to this, a prison cell and not knowing what their future held, beaten severely, stuck in this dark place and not knowing what was gonna happen next. And what did they choose to do in that moment? But to pray and sing songs of praise to the Lord. And the other people were listening to them. The other prisoners were listening to them. I want you to think about the impact of what our actions would be in comparison to what the impact of Paul and Silas's actions were. So if we shouted or protested or complained or begged or cried or tried to escape or fought back, etc., what kind of impact would that have had for the gospel? And I would argue that these efforts would not have had any impact for the gospel because they completely focused on us. We've been treated unjustly. We're being railroaded. We don't deserve this. We're innocent. These would have probably been the very first things to come into my mind. And sitting in that prison cell myself, I could imagine being in self-pity and in deep depression. But Paul's actions didn't point to him like our actions might have pointed to us in this situation. Paul's actions instead pointed to God. In the midst of an injustice, in the midst of harsh treatment, he prayed and he continued to give God praise despite the hardship that is facing him in that moment. How often do you think that confident prayer and joyful praise took place in the midst of that dark, dingy prison at any point before or after Paul? How many times do you think confident prayer and joyful praise broke out in that prison. I would probably guess that was the only time it ever, ever happened. And again, verse 25, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening. Why did Luke think it was important to include, and the other prisoners were listening to them? Why was that important to include that here? What did he mean by this? I think we're about to see the answer in the next few verses. Starting in verse 26, it says, Suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors open, he, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. We are all here. The jailer called for the lights, rushed in, and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all his household were baptized. 
The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his entire household. You know, Jenny asked me an important question this week when she read this passage. She asked, why didn't the other prisoners run away? You might think, okay, I've read enough of Acts to know about Paul. I could probably guess why he didn't run away. But it says that all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose, not just Paul and Silas. So if you're thinking about a prison and who might be in there, robbers and rapists and murderers and who else, right? Uh, you know, all kinds of people for all kinds of crimes and not one of them ran away when their opportunity presented itself. Not one, with their chains off and their doors open, decide to go run for their own freedom. Why didn't the other prisoners run away? Well, maybe Paul and Silas stayed because it's the right thing to do, but what about those others? And again, I draw your attention to verse 25. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Paul's worship and Paul's witness while in prison likely led many, if not all, of the prisoners to faith in Jesus. The text doesn't explicitly state that. I wish that it did, but it is about the only explanation I can think of for why all these other prisoners didn't take that opportunity to flee and save themselves. Further, it explains the jailer's response. Look at what the jailer says in verse 30. It says, he then brought them out and asked them, sirs, what must I do to be saved? So how do we get from Paul telling the guard that, don't worry, don't kill yourself, we're all here, to the, guard, the jailer asking, what must I do to be saved? When did salvation become part of the question, part of the conversation? What is, why did he ask this question, what must I do to be saved? Where did the concept of salvation come from? And I would argue that Paul, being Paul, has been doing a whole lot more than just praying and singing hymns, but also proclaiming the gospel to the other prisoners who have been listening to him in the prison. And this conversation has been going on, and the jailer has heard it, and this was the straw that broke the camel's back for him. He had finally come to believe when the earthquake shook, all the prisoners were free, and they were all there. That's a miracle in and of itself. We continue on in verse 35. It says, when it was daylight, the magistrates sent their officers to the jailer with the order, release those men. The jailer told Paul, the magistrates have ordered that you and Silas be released. Now you could go. Now you could leave. Go in peace. But Paul said to the officers, they beat us publicly without a trial, even though we're Roman citizens, and they threw us into prison. And now do they want to get rid of us quietly? No. Let them come themselves and escort us out. The officers reported this to the magistrates, and when they heard that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens, they were alarmed. They came to appease them and escorted them from the prison, requesting them to leave the city. After Paul and Silas came out of the prison, they went to Lydia's house, where they met with the brothers and sisters and encouraged them. Then they left. Here's the part that challenges me the most from this text. All of this could have been avoided, right? Uh, Paul and Silas were Roman citizens, okay? In the Roman world, among the Roman colonies, Roman citizens are treated with a dignity, with a respect that other people were not. Roman citizens were seen as higher than everybody else who was a non-Roman citizen anywhere in the Roman world. And the assumption was that since Paul and, and Silas were Jews, that they wouldn't be Roman citizens. In fact, very few Jews had Roman citizenship, but both Paul and Silas did. So here's the question. When Paul and Silas are dragged into the marketplace before the magistrates and these accusations are being made, why didn't they just say, we're Roman citizens? which would have either gotten them turned loose or at least would have given them a fair trial 
to be able to explain their side and their punishment probably would not have been as severe even if they were found to be in the wrong. So why not tell them? Why go through all of this? And I'm gonna suggest four reasons this morning. The first is this, the salvation of the other prisoners because they do not hear and see the gospel lived out in Paul and Silas, if not for this. The second is the salvation of the jailer and his family, who also would not have come to faith in Jesus, if not for this. The third is the countless people who heard the gospel, either from the prisoners or from the jailer, and then those who heard the gospel from those who heard the gospel from them, and on and on and on. We have absolutely no idea how far the gospel reached as a result of these people in the prison and the jailer having come to faith in Jesus. And the fourth reason I'll give is this, the encouragement of the church at Philippi. We see this in verse 40. After Paul and Silas came out of the prison, they went to Lydia's house, where they met with the brothers and sisters and encouraged them. Then they left. Think about it, the way in which uh, Paul and Silas were imprisoned uh, right after the gospel was first preached in Philippi and a, and a small little group of Jewish people came to faith in Jesus. If Paul and Silas went into prison that way and were never heard from again, that might have been the end of the church at Philippi. But the fact that they were then let out by the magistrates and were able to come back and encourage this fledgling church is probably the reason we see decades later the, in the book of, Phil, of Philippians, Paul referring to a church that's well-established and has been a long partner in the gospel ministry. And so for all of these reasons, um, I think that's why Paul didn't say that at the beginning. But isn't it interesting? That would have been the first thing I say. If that's my get out of jail free card, if that's my go lightly on me card, I'd be the quickest to play that card. I, 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 I would say probably most of us, and I think all of us would at least be tempted to. And yet Paul was willing to go through that and in his suffering, in his time of hardship, his worship and his witness still on display spoke volumes more. And God was able to do amazing things through a difficult trial that he had to walk through. Here's some problems that we face. Why me, and I don't think I'm the only one, are quick to play that get out of trouble free card uh, instead of walk through seasons of suffering, seasons of hardship, and to do it well before the Lord and others. Here's some problems we face. Our culture has trained us to look out for ourselves first. We were talking about this in Sunday school this morning. You know, Paul was very fluid in his plans. He knew what God called him to do, and he went and did it. And when obstacles or, uh, you know, excursions or uh, trouble happened, prisons happened, things happened, he just flowed with it and honored God in every situation that he was in. And we are trained to look out for ourselves. So we, we tend to go and do the thing that God would want us to do, but when trouble comes up, we're quick on the defense, at least I know I am. Our culture has trained us to voice our grievances. If you do not believe this, please look at your Facebook newsfeed. We are trained in our culture to complain about everything that bothers us. Here's another one. We have largely bought into the lie that God wants to keep us from harm. If you think that that's true, please again read the, light, the journey of Paul, even in this one instance. God makes no such promise. He promises us a future where there'll be no more pain, no more sorrow, no more death, no more harm, no more sin, perfection forever in his presence. But that day is not today. But we have largely bought into the lie that God wants to keep us from harm. And most of us would not reflect Christ well in the midst of suffering. I thank the Lord that I have not had tremendous periods of suffering in my life yet. I know that they, they come for all of us. We've had difficult times, but nothing even close to Paul here. But I always wonder how I will represent the Lord. Will it be good or will it be poorly on that day? 
And these are just some of the struggles that we face because we live within a particular culture. We have lived a certain way. Uh, and because of that, we have to be intentional about thinking through how our worship and our witness are, are heard, are seen by those outside, not just in our good seasons of life, but in the difficult seasons of life. Because one thing that's intrinsic to all of humanity is that difficulty, hardship, evil, pain, and suffering exists, and it's a part of our human condition and our world until Jesus comes again. And so we will have high points in life, and we will have low points. And we need to honor the, honor the Lord in both of those, because the world is always watching our worship and our witness in both of those scenarios. Here's what we learn from Paul and Silas. Hardships and suffering provide us an opportunity to live out our true faith before others. This was not putting on a facade. This was not trying to, this was not, this was not Paul trying to put on a show uh, in this bad situation. It was coming out of the overflow of, of, of his relationship with the Lord. It was honest prayer and it was honest worship. And people were seeing it in the depths of that prison and they were listening. Here's what else we learn from Paul and Silas, that suffering well demonstrates to others who, uh, who are also suffering that there is hope greater than the present suffering. And that was a big sentence. Present suffering, right? Suffering well for the Lord demonstrates to others who are also suffering, right? That there's a hope that's greater than the hardship, than the suffering they're going through. It's easy to say that, right? You're going through a hard time. Uh, you know, it could have been worse. You know, hey, you know, it'll, it'll be all right. You know, that, that's, those are cliches. A lot of times, you know, we say those things because we think it's going to mean something, and a lot of times they fall on deaf ears. But when you're going through it, and your whole life is exuding a confidence in that fact, then when you say that to somebody else who's suffering, that there's a hope greater than what you're going through, and they can look at you and see that it must be true because it's evident in your life, that speaks volumes. Our worship and our witness are amplified in those moments, and we see that in the life of Paul and Silas here. Here's the caveat. Hardships show us who we really are, right? They show that they're a good barometer of where our faith in the Lord actually is. Hardships reveal the truth about our faith, the truth about our trust in God, the truth about our source of joy, the truth about, what we, about the hope that we truly possess in the Lord. If we have a shallow faith, then we'll hold pity parties in those moments, right? Uh, it, we're not going to praise the Lord when hard times come we're going we're gonna to wallow in the despair. If we don't trust God, then we're going to complain, woe is me, instead of engaging in powerful prayer when suffering comes. Hardships show who we really are. They reveal the truth about our faith. And so therefore, we need to nurture our relationship with the Lord while things are going well, so that we don't waver when life gets hard. And here's the exciting thing I see also here, perhaps a, a byproduct of our study, is that God can grow our witness. We are responsible for our worship and our witness. How we live in good times and in bad, how we point to Jesus instead of to ourselves, right? But God can take that and multiply it. God can take that and grow that. And so Paul and Silas used their imprisonment to glorify God, and their fellow prisoners gave their lives to Jesus as a result. Maybe it started with just one or two. Can you imagine it? The, one right, the person in the cell right next to him started asking him, why on earth are you singing praises to God? Do you know where you are right now? And Paul responds with the truth of the gospel and unwavering hope in Christ and leads that man to Jesus. And now he's joining in the singing and in the praying. And the person in the cell next to him is saying, what on earth is wrong with you? Do you know where you are right now? And a domino effect of God growing the ministry in that horrible place 
at that important time. When God shook the prison with an earthquake, the prisoners didn't flee because they now honored God more than themselves. And this was enough to bring the jailer to belief, him and his entire family. How can God grow our witness as we put him on display? Yes, in good times, but also in bad times as we live our lives before those people all around us who are always watching. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you that the things that we know about you, your faithfulness, your sovereignty, your promises, what you've done in the past, what you're going to do in the future, that they do not ever change regardless of whether we're going through a good time or a bad time in our life. We thank you, Lord, that your promises for us, the salvation that Jesus secured, the relationship we have with you, do not change whether we're going through a good time or a bad time on this earth. We're thankful, Lord, that despite the fact that we know that until Jesus comes back, there will be both high points and low points in this life, you promise to always be present with us. Lord, I know that we lift up prayer sometimes, ways that we want our situation resolved and really quickly, and sometimes in your wisdom and your perfect knowledge, you know that that's not the best thing for us. Sometimes you don't answer our prayers exactly the way we ask them to be answered but you promise that you will always be present with us. And Lord, you always do answer our prayers in the appropriate way, at the appropriate time. And we thank you, Lord, that you give us strength and sustain us in even the hardest times that we go through in our lives. Lord, help us to, to trust in these things, to trust in you. And Lord, may we be ever conscious of both our worship and our witness, both in the good seasons of life and in the dark and hard seasons of life. Let us always be cognizant of the fact that there are people always watching, and even those who are ridiculing us for our faith in Jesus in the right moment as your spirit works and as we live through our good and bad times in life. May they see our worship and our witness, and may it be what your spirit uses to lead them to Jesus. Lord, I was one of those people. I was a skeptic. I was angry. I didn't want to believe that there was a God. I didn't want to believe that the things that I had gone through in my life uh, could have been allowed by a God. And yet I saw the gospel at work in other people's lives. And I heard the message and your spirit invited me and I have received the blessed hope that is only offered in Jesus. And Lord, all of us have stories similar to that. May we be the ones that are used now for others to see the gospel in action, to hear it, and to respond. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.